Hi, everyone. We're about to start our session. OK, so welcome to uh, the BPF Gender, the Best Practice Forum on Gender and Access for 2018. We are trying to do a roundtable here, even though uh, we don't really have the arrangements for a roundtable. But uh, we'll, we'll make do with what we have. OK, so I'm Radhika Radhakrishnan. I am a gender studies researcher from India. And I'm also the consultant for the BPF Gender this year. We have a great lineup of uh, speakers with us today. So I'm going to first quickly introduce, I'm first going to quickly introduce the speakers uh, that we have. Uh, we have Agustina, who is uh, uh, from the Internet Society. Uh, she's the Global Engagement Manager at ISOC, and uh, she drives the Sustainable Development Goals there. This year, she's also co-facilitating the BPF Gender and Access, and has been very instrumental in helping us put together all of this today. Uh, uh, we have Anri, uh, who manages the research ICT Africa's Digital Policy Project, uh, and she's also been the rapporteur for BPF Gender in 2015, as well as 2016, which have been like the sort of founding stones for us to do the work in 2018. Um, we have uh, Nicola, who um, is the Gender and Social Impact Facilitator for APC, uh, the local access project that they do. Uh, it focuses on community networks. Uh, and we will hear a lot more about uh, community networks and her work with that even during the session today. We also have with us uh, Ritu, who is the general manager of uh, research and advocacy at the Digital Empowerment Foundation in India. Uh, we also have uh, Rashi, who is the community liaison manager at the Bachao Project in India. Uh, and then we have uh, Bruna, who is not uh, who is not up. Yeah, she's she's there behind. She will come up uh, later during the session. Uh, Bruna is a consultant and researcher at Coding Rights, uh, where she works uh, with the legislative support. Um, and we have uh, Alejandra, Alejandra, who is here. Where? OK. Hi. Hi, Alejandra. Could you come? Would you like to come up? Um, OK. We can call you up when your segment starts. OK, so we have Alejandra, who is a MAG member. And she's also the communication manager of the Agency of uh, Government and Information Society at the Office of the President in the Government of Uruguay. OK, so um, this year, the theme that we had, as you can see up on the slides, is uh, the impact of supplementary models of connectivity in enabling meaningful internet access for women and gender non-binary persons. It's a very long name, so I'm just going to first of all kind of break this down to understand what we really mean with this, OK? So when we say supplementary models of connectivity, I'm not going to go into like the technical definitional uh, aspects of this, because there are lots of papers that already focus on that, OK? But we are really trying to focus on the gender aspects here. Uh, but what we, uh, just to clarify what we mean by this term, is uh, complementary telecommunication infrastructure models that speed up the pace at which unconnected populations can be connected to the internet. So examples that we're looking at are community networks, public Wi-Fi, TV white spaces, uh, zero rating, and such. Uh, when we say meaningful internet access, that's something that the BPF has moved towards over the past few years, where we're trying to envision not just internet access, but Inter meaningful internet access, which is really beneficial to the user at the end of the day. So uh, whatever uh, benefits I'm trying to accrue from the internet, be it empowerment, uh, more active participation in the public, et cetera, those are rights that I'll actually be able to gain uh, through, through this kind of access. Uh, when we say women, we are including girls and anyone who identifies as women. So we're talking about the social construct of gender. <coughs> And we're also very importantly talking about gender as a spectrum. So when we say gender non-binary persons, we're talking about people who don't identify within the gender binary of male or female. Uh, OK, so can we go to the next slide, please? OK, thank you. So. Uh, we have functioned, uh, BPFs have always functioned in a bottom-up, multi-stakeholder, community-driven manner, which means that all the work we do, uh, it happens in a participatory method. Everything we produce, it's open for comments. Uh, we are always looking for discussions, and we take all that feedback into consideration. And as you can see, uh, and is represented by the speakers today, uh, we try to have uh, multiple stakeholders from different communities and different region, uh, regions uh, representing the work. 
Um, and uh, so it started off in 2015, uh, and Andre was uh, uh, the rapporteur then, uh, where the focus was on online abuse and gender-based violence against women. And then in 2016, the uh, work focused on barriers to enable women's uh, meaningful internet access. Uh, and then in 2017, we realized that, okay, you know, these barriers that, that we have identified, different communities of women experience these barriers differently. And therefore, 2017's work really tried to look at different communities of women, uh, so like refugee women, young women, rural women, LGBTQI women, and tried to understand how these barriers affect them in accessing the internet. So what we're doing in 2018 is really building a upon all of this work, and we're trying to look at supplementary models of connectivity, such as community networks, public Wi-Fi, et cetera, and how these models of connectivity have an impact on all these different communities of women in uh, helping them access the internet. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so I will just very quickly go through the methodology here, but uh, we have our uh, draft output paper that's up on the website and it's open for comments. So I encourage and invite all of you to please uh, go and uh, read that. Uh, so you'll have like a much more detailed understanding of the work we're doing. But very briefly, the method that we used to get our findings today uh, were two surveys, two online surveys. One was uh, through Google Forms and the other was a Lime survey, uh, which uh, APC helped us host, so thank you. We also had uh, virtual meetings and theme calls like on a weekly to uh, once every two weeks uh, kind of a thing, where we also try to introduce some calls where we had themes. Um, so for example, one theme was gender non-binary persons and internet access for them. So we had people from those communities coming and talking to us about the problems that they faced, et cetera. So you know, trying to get inputs from uh, everyone involved. Uh, we also had mobile messaging that, uh, thanks to Renata, we were able to set up. Renata is uh, here today. Uh, so uh, thank you, Renata, uh, where basically we allowed people to uh, send us messages on WhatsApp and other mobile applications to send in their inputs. We also had our mailing list continued where people could send us uh, their submissions. We had a separate email ID uh, dedicated for submissions. And of course, this IGF session where we hope to have a great session and discuss with all the participants here uh, and take forward our findings. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through some of the main findings just to contextualize the discussion that will happen in this session today. Uh, but again, as I said, the detailed findings are in the paper, so please feel free to go and access that on the website. Okay, so some of the barriers that were identified in the previous years for women and gender non-binary persons to access the internet, uh, we think that by having supplementary models of connectivity, you can overcome to an extent some of these barriers, right? So some of the analysis we've done includes, so for example, availability is the first barrier that we, um, is the first barrier that was identified in the previous year where women had no access to broadband. Uh, and for example, if public uh, internet centers were in spaces where women could not culturally access because of restrictions in their movements. So supplementary models of connectivity can help this concern by providing greater ownership to the users. So for example, community networks which are owned by the community and governed according to democratic principles will give women more ownership over the availability of internet for them to you know, accrue the benefits out of it. The second is in terms of affordability, which is not just affordability uh, in terms of the devices and data, but also whether or not someone has disposable income and the financial liquidity to be able to actually make these decisions and connect to the internet. So a lot of supplementary models uh, are structured in a way that they uh, are offering low cost and free alternative methods, so women can really avail of this in cases where women are, where girl children are often not given the same kind of financial independence as boys in a, in a, in a lot of places around the world. Uh, so the third is culture and norms where, uh, and this is a very important finding, right, that like the reason that a lot of women cannot connect to the internet today is because there are a lot of cultural norms that stop them from doing that. So the, the, the problem is not the mobile phone, it's the power 
uh, dynamics that exist around that mobile phone. So women are prohibited from accessing the internet because there are ideals of what a good woman is. And if you connect to the internet and speak to strangers online, then you're not a good woman anymore, right? So we do acknowledge that it's very difficult to tackle this barrier and supplementary models of connectivity cannot fully address this because we do need a specific focus um, on culture and norms to be able to solve this. But it's an important finding for us to, to put out here. Uh, the fourth is in terms of availability of relevant content. So women, uh, even if they do connect to the internet, uh, because of uh, reasons such as the literacy gap or, uh, you know, girls are socialized to have lesser confidence than uh, boys when it comes to accessing ICTs, etc. cetera, uh, you are not able to get uh, relevant content on the internet. So supplementary models such as, for example, zero rating allows you to provide services that are tailored to the users that they, um, uh, to, that they cater to. And therefore, in this way, if you focus specifically on women and gender non-binary persons, you can get these benefits and overcome this barrier to an extent. Uh, and lastly, participation in decision-making roles pertaining to the internet, where uh, we, we think it's important for women and gender non-binary persons to not just be users of internet, but also act uh, you know, decision makers in all uh, in all issues relating to the internet. So when uh, so we do understand that while these models can help you access the internet, it does not necessarily have to translate into decision making power. So that link is something that we're still looking to explore, and hopefully, is uh, we will get more ideas about this even in the session. And we invite um, we invite all participants also when we when we open up the floor for discussion. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so lastly, why are we focusing on supplementary models of connectivity in t from a gender focus, right? It's really important for us to note, like at the foremost, that technology does not have a neutral impact, and it can and often does reproduce uh, social, economic, and cultural inequalities in the context that it is deployed in. And this is something that we also observe in the models of connectivity that we're looking at today. Um, and when we say a gender focus, what we're talking about here is that we're looking at how uh, the, same, uh, the same policies or the same social phenomena will impact women and gender non-binary persons trans persons, queer persons differently than they, would, than they would impact others, which is why it's important for us to look for gender perspective specifically in something and not just add it like an add-on task towards the end when you audit it, et cetera, right? Uh, another important uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that when we speak of gender, we're, we're never speaking of gender just as gender. We're also speaking of it in terms of it intersecting with sex, religion, caste, class, and ability, and therefore we can't homogenize women as one community, so that's also something that will uh, come out repeatedly during the session today, uh, and something that has been focused on in the, in the previous sessions uh, of, of BPF as well. Okay, so uh, one of our key findings was that in this way, the gender focus is really limited in most of the initiatives that we found. So while there are many initiatives that, let's say, tackle community networks, there aren't many that uh, have a specific gender focus in the way that uh, I, I've been talking about it. And uh, we did not encounter any initiatives that specifically focused on gender non-binary persons. We acknowledge that this may just be that we have not heard of these uh, initiatives and they do exist in silos in some part of the world. So we do treat this as a living document and hope that we will get more inputs and be able to add on to this. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to put on, um, you can go to the next one. I've covered this, thank you. Okay, I've just put on the board some initiatives. I'm not going to go into the details of these because uh, like, you will find a lot more about this in the paper. But these are some of the initiatives that we found uh, specifically focusing on, um, on women uh, in community networks. And uh, the next slide. Okay, uh, we have Nick here as well, who will really be able to talk to us more during the session about the gender focus 
of community networks, but I'm just going to read out this one slide to contextualize that. Uh, the knowledge produced in studying social and gender impact and the claims made about women in community networks are shaped by a discourse that is white, male, and Western. This foundation makes it difficult to escape from imposing assumptions that gender, ethnicity, and class relations in the global south exist in the same form as those in the global north. So that's something for us, that, that this is one of the ways in which it's important for us to, you know, really look uh, through this gender perspective that we're talking about when we analyze these different models of connectivity. And we will do that for a lot more models during the session today. Again, I've just put up a few uh, initiatives that focus on TV white spaces, which is another um, uh, which is another supplementary model of connectivity where unused frequencies are used, uh, uh, unused frequencies in the wireless spectrum are used to provide internet connectivity. Uh, these are some that we found. We're happy to hear from you and get more inputs. Uh, these were some of the key findings that uh, that we had um, in our paper. And I'm going to start off the first segment uh, for today's session. Um, the first segment now is about how we want to build, because we've now realized that, okay, there aren't a lot of initiatives that are focusing on gender. So what can we now do to make sure that if I'm an initiative who wants to focus on gender in these models, what do I have to do? So what are some recommendations that we'd like to propose? Uh, uh, those are things that we'd like to open up uh, for the session and discuss right now. Uh, so uh, we can start off with, uh, Andri, uh, Andri, will you be able to talk to us about uh, this idea of the gender perspective? So the fact that all people do need to connect to the internet, but we're still specifically focusing on uh, women and we're specifically focusing on gender binary persons. So what is the specific need for that? Where does that arise from? If you could maybe uh, tell us a little about it, we could help that contextualize it with the rest of the conversation. Sure, I'll try to do that. I mean, I think maybe it's also good to take a step back and just consider where this best practice forum came from, because I think that's an interesting finding in itself. Um, the first year it focused on online abuse and gender-based violence, which we then started understanding as a barrier to access, one of many barriers to access. And alongside the other intersectional activities of the IGF, like connecting and enabling the next billion, there then started being a focus on looking at after access issues. Um, and that, I think, comes from the assumption that if you have access, that's not necessarily going to solve your problems. Um, and the reason for focusing on gender specifically when it comes to access is, well, the statistics don't lie. There's a big gap between men and women. Um, and yes, there is a challenge in the sense that we, we only look at male, female um, in most of the statistics. And the statistics we have at the moment by itself, just the male, female binary, um, is so limited that encouraging you know, broader classification is really difficult. Um, I mean, even developed countries struggle to sometimes get the data up to date and, and in on time. And the ITU statistics, which we have, which have a, an estimate of what the disparity is, um, is also an estimate. So, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's already a big challenge. And then you start looking at um, least developed countries, et cetera, which you know, face even more substantial difficulty in gathering data to, be, to enable us to have a bigger perspective of why you know, this gap and, and why we need to focus on women specifically. Um, the reason, again, for focusing on women is because if you look at many of the barriers, like online abuse, um, but not just online abuse, other barriers like um, education, um, um, affordability, um, structural barriers really, and also cultural barriers that prevent women from having access, a lot of those impact women much worse than they impact men. And we see that in uh, the organization I work for is Research ISD Africa. Um, we see that in household access and use surveys, um, which are representative, um, and the fact that a lot of, um, a lot of the, the people, many of the people who are unconnected are based at the are already people who are in rural areas or have very low um, levels of income. Often gender isn't such a big factor, it's more where you're located in that sort of um, environment, whether you're in a rural area or whether you have a certain level of education and your income. So I mean, the, the bigger question is whether, um, if, you, if you talk about gender, whether then gender is a determining, fact, determining factor for whether you'll be online or not. But the fact is, most women are located at those bottom bottom layers. So I think they, I mean, 
um, I have to qualify it and say we have very li limited data. The data that we have is only sort of anecdotal to some extent, with the exception of um, some data such as the, um, that which is gathered by um, the After Access Network, and then the data that we have from ITU, et cetera, is quite dated. Um, it's also aggregated, although it is, it is a, a good indicator of, of those difficulties. Um, and I think it just speaks to a broader need for looking at beyond access issues because often it's not just gender as a determining factor. Thank you so much, Andrew. I think uh, the lack of gender data or gender disaggregated data, even in all of the large data sets that we have, um, from everything when we collect census to, you know, um, the ability to analyze gender when you don't have a specific gender aggregated data is, is definitely something important that hopefully if we point out, uh, there will be efforts made towards uh, correcting that to uh, an extent. So thank you for your uh, insights. Uh, we can um, move on to Nick. Nick, uh, because you've done a lot of work on community networks, uh, will you be able to tell us about the difficulties that you've had in researching uh, about gender impacts in community networks? And uh, what do community networks need to do to start incorporating these gender perspectives since one of the findings that we have is that there haven't been very uh, specific gender perspectives involved at the time these initiatives were uh, formed. Yeah, that's very correct. Um, so I'm just going to reflect over the past year's work that I've been doing with APC's local access project. Um, I've done about 250 interviews in six countries in three areas, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Um, and I'm only just starting to analyze the data right now because I only got back from Indonesia really shortly ago. But there's some things that have come through and are challenging. So one of the things is, is I had a year, which is an exploratory research, and I was, my role was to look at the social and gender impacts. Um, so there's a general frame of increasing the opportunities for success in community networks. And this has the uh, limitation of diluting a gender focus. So we have to do what we can do with the resources that we've got. But I think this might come up quite often in these type of projects. Um, Secondly, is the, I, the, the idea of community networks themselves are collectivists. So they are uh, telecommunication networks built by citizens for citizens. And so you're uh, approaching a collectivity in the first place, which means you're not, you haven't got the same independence as you might do in some other kind of gender research. Um, so of those, two of the six I looked at had the classic build it ourselves model. The remainder were triggered or supported by an external entity. And often that entity was quite gender sensitive, but not always. But perhaps more problematic was it was often separated from the community itself. So it didn't actually know uh, quite how to provide me access to the women uh, that I wanted. So I, in my focus groups, I have female women focus groups and men focus groups. And I try to do various things to create spaces for women to speak openly. But because it's based on a collectivist principle, there's already a bit of a difficulty in that. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So the other thing is the time issue. Um, so I was looking at a breadth of cultures, religions, economic circumstances, ranging from um, uh, very low income uh, groups to people who had uh, qu quite good income and quite high education uh, across a whole range from gender inequality values from three low, uh, three, three sites had three low gender inequality and, and one had high for the country. So this diversity and the shortness of being able to cover all of those areas and topics meant there was a lot of difficulties in accessing the issues that are local gendering processes in themselves. So it kind of becomes a little bit superficial and doesn't hit that that point that you mentioned. And returning to that ethic of the collective versus the individual, um, sometimes, so, so I always shared my research methods beforehand, and um, people were very, very welcoming. And I hadn't met a single person that was not supportive of gender 
perspectives, right? All the men that I met and worked with were all supportive. They didn't, but supportive doesn't necessarily mean they knew what to do. And um, so uh, I would ask for a male and female facilitator stroke translator, um, and it was only one uh, network that was able to provide me that. Uh, sometimes I uh, was able to get external ones, but that comes with the dis disadvantage that they're not part of the community. So you have this kind of double-edged sword. Um, and, and then a couple of times when I, um, and some of the women, uh, asked, uh, can we just have a woman-only space for this, um, some of the delightful male facilitators who were from the community were quite hurt that they weren't included in that space. And we're talking about communities, so these things matter. Um, we don't want to go around hurting people's feelings in our communities, and it comes with a whole load of power relations. Um, and then sometimes it was really bad in se the sense of uh, I would find a space to sit with a woman and men would just loiter around and they would not give her the space to speak privately to me. It was, and, and, that, and that happened in, in a couple of countries and it um, was, was particularly difficult. Um, so, to answer your question about what do community networks need to do to start including a gender perspective, I'd like to say most are in some way, or they're very receptive, but they don't always know what to do. Um, so one of the things I want to rem uh, remind about the community networks of the sort that I studied, which is in rural places, um, is a community network is part of every, somebody's everyday life. You don't leave it behind when you uh, come home from work. It's embedded in your community. It's part of your families. It's part of your loves and frustrations and all of those type of things. Um, so the answer to a gender perspective can't be a top-down. It has to come within the living system of a community network, which is very complicated to achieve. Um, it's interesting to note that one of the community networks that there was most gender inequality was also the one where, for political reasons, a woman had been put at the front of it. Um, and I think um, that, that suggests to us that this cannot be a kind of um, superficial, just put somebody in charge and let's hope that will work. And that's a, more of a political act than actually an act that helps people have agency. So um, there were varied com um, community networks, but most of them um, were based on some kind of local governance structure, like a tribal authority, an indigenous assembly, a grand panchaya, or the Indonesian equivalent of that. And those... Um, themselves are um, inherently patriarchal structures. They're very male-dominated structures. So at the end of the day, the participants I spoke to, the 70%, uh, so men consti constituted 70% of the initiators or champions that I interviewed, 70% um, of the operators or members, people who are hands-on in the community networks, 50% of the users of the community networks are people who don't tend to be in technical or decision-making roles, and only 35% of the non-users. So you can see that there is a fair amount of reproducing the same structure, right? Um, However, let's end on a positive note. Um, one of the things that was, became more and more clear is that many of the women who have slowly had considerable agency or influence in the community network um, had done so kind of in a quiet way, building through the back door. So this is community members who are doing an awful lot of the hard work in keeping the community network going. And to begin with, this is the invisible labor, the plugging the charge, uh, phones in to be charged that the husband or the brother didn't, couldn't be bothered to get out of bed to do. And that via, via doing that, they slowly got some considerable um, power in things. Um, and so, and this, uh, and so the, this is, is an emergent thing, and how do we encourage that? And the second thing, and I wanted just to end on, was um, in terms of your meaningful access. 
So a lot of the women who contributed work in keeping the community network going also or mentioned contributing work to collectivist practice in the community in themselves. So that's um, in many uh, Latin American communities they do um, community work or in Indonesia they cook for the community and things like that so they were also engaged in those other activities and um, they mentioned and this is quite interesting thing to end on perhaps that they um, they were worried about younger women who were technically empowered able to use the internet or even to develop things, becoming less and less part of their local community. And in a few occasions, I would find um, those women went and started entrepreneurial activities. So having to butt against the um, male governance structure, what they ended up doing was going and starting their own thing. Um, and the older women, or the people who are more part of the collectivist activities, are very worried about that because they said, well, this is not what we want them going off and doing that. We want them to be part of our community activities. And one of the ways through that, I, w I was thinking, and I'm and speaking, getting quite a good reception, is to start paying more attention to and putting more value on the type of activities that the women are already doing. So in all community networks, the women were involved in craft, in cooking, and so on. And that was often what they used their access to the internet to. But this is also part of the social glue of their communities. And there's a tendency when we talk about community networks to treat those type of uses of the internet, to find out how to uh, create a... Um, a brooch for your hijab and then sell it online to make a, a new recipe. That there's a tendency that these should be fitted into the corners. But actually, they are an inherent part of the social glue of the community. And they shouldn't be treated as frivolous, non sometimes they are income generating, um, but they shouldn't be treated as the things that you should... It shouldn't waste valuable internet resources on, because actually they are the things that are bringing many of the women together, and they are contributing to the community no network through doing that. So I hope I haven't gone on too long. Um, maybe I have. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nick. Those are uh, certainly very valuable inputs, and it's very interesting to hear uh, how these dynamics actually play out uh, on the ground. Uh, you know, when uh, to really find suitable solutions, uh, and it's it's very interesting to hear how complex these dynamics are. Something that doesn't always uh, come out. So uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, you bringing forth these ideas to the session today. Uh, so, uh, and this also highlights uh, what we were talking about earlier in terms of how, therefore, the gender analysis has to be there from ev in every single step of the way. It's not just something that we can include in the end because of how complex these dynamics are and the way in which uh, you know these communities are structured and how uh, how they do perpetrate at the end of the day the same kind of social relations that exist outside of it. Uh, so to continue on that same, uh, so to pick up on that uh, that strand and to go ahead, um, I will ask Rashi how, uh, some thoughts on how we can then integrate these gender components into internet access initiatives at every step of the way. So from the planning to the budgeting to the implementation process, uh, any thoughts and ideas on, on how this, this can be implemented given these these kinds of dynamics? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, I, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, from the past year, have been uh, working on uh, w working on a gender perspective uh, on the internet shutdowns and how it impacts the lives of women in Manipur. Uh, what what we did realize is that uh, Manipur has always been uh, socially and politically uh, filled with. Uh, high conflict between ethnic groups. Uh, there's, uh, there's been a lot of armed conflict, and therefore, uh, even though internet is accessible, uh, the internet service providers, the, the internet service providers uh, have uh, 
they, it's basically it's basically very expensive. Uh, we have they have access to low quality internet, and uh, there are so many internet shutdowns that happen. Uh, I think the the last shutdown that happened was for over a hundred days. Uh, it it in fact it uh, it impacts the social well being, uh, the personal and professional lives of women, and uh, many of we then we realize that even the exposure to the ba the basic access or using WhatsApp or Facebook was not that great. So uh, what uh, technical, uh, what do you say, uh, the recommendations we would give is uh, uh, build community networks, uh, first start training them in the basic technical literacy, uh, and probably uh, come up with solutions on how you could uh, build, uh, ma manufacture, and then finally um, you know, uh, finally be able to mo monetize using those networks and also to make sure that they are secure enough so that they are not vulnerable to uh, online violence. Thank you so much, Rashi, and also thank you for uh, bringing out these different uh, aspects of uh, things like internet shutdowns and how, you know, they can specifically uh, affect different communities of women in, in, in ways uh, that, that you were mentioning. So thank you. Um, we do have, as we mentioned, we do have some initiatives that we could find uh, that do have these gender perspectives to an extent incorporated into them. But we're really interested uh, in today's session to also see, you know, how these kinds of initiatives would then look like. So, you know, so far we've been talking about how we would like to incorporate these kinds of perspectives into initiatives. Uh, we can now maybe look at, uh, you know, what these kind of initiatives would look like. So we could probably discuss some existing case studies or some ideas for, you know, how we can then um, how we can then make these kinds of implementations. So, uh, Ritu, would you would you like to uh, start on uh, telling us a little bit about what these kinds of initiatives that do incorporate the gender perspectives we've been talking about so far? What what these initiatives would look like in practice? Thanks, Radhika. I think I'll go back to the, my colleague Nick has already been explaining about what community networks were. I come from India and I work with Digital Empowerment Foundation, which has the largest community network in India, having access of a 138 access nodes and connected to the 38 districts of the country. Uh, when we had conceptualized the community networks in India, we did not think about gender, frankly speaking, we did not. When we think about community networks, we always think about that the innovative technological innovations that how it will connect to the community. But that's the importance that when the community is connected, the, that is technological is not the important, but the how it will become the sustainable and how it will become uh, engaged with the community, that's the place where community networks play. In fact, and this, that's the place where uh, vacuum is always there, that community networks are sometimes isolated and sometimes not being part of the committee. So to make the community network safe and the space for the committee, it is important that the gender play, women comes and play the important role. And that's where the, com uh, the community networks have a very critical aspects of uh, women engagement in the community networks, from making them into sustainable, from managing the client services to the grievances, to managing the user logs of that particular clients is the place where the women are playing the role. Uh, I'll uh, give you an example of our community networks in India, what we had done it, we had made a barefoot women wireless engineers. And these women engineers are not so sophisticated Cisco engineers, or they do have a Cisco degree or any engineering degree. They already, all of them are coming coming from the lo uh, lo uh, local committees, and they just understand that how it, they can engage with us orally, not even a writ lit written or a, or a written language as well, or they can read or write something. The oral language which they communicate to us is the important aspect for us. The, uh, the aspect when they communicate to us, they manage the uh, client uh, relationship. They manage the uh, how much money is being spent on a one person client and how much data they are uh, occupying on the managing that bandwidth. That entire concept makes this community network sustainable and that's where the women are playing the role. Some of our women are also trying to, it, uh, it's, when we think about technology, we always think that women can, can't climb the tower. Women will be a fragile and they will be fall. 
It's not like that. They will, they can climb the tower. And some of our case studies, which is mentioned in a GIS watch paper, is that I have shared the two of the stories of a Kainat and Fozia who had climbed the tower of a 140 meters of a climb the tower and also sat on the tower and drink the tea as well. Uh, so it's uh, sometimes that technology and the Gender aspect is seen as a dis is a balance, which is a trying to make a balance between the gender and the technology. However, I, I for my according to me that both are, uh, both can go together to together. Both can be, if you look from the aspect that low cost technology and affordability, and the aspect that how we can build the minimum nuances of a oral communication, and it's a simple language it can be turned into, that can be talked. To about the gender aspect is automatically built. Actually, the another thing that uh, the another aspect what we uh, is there is uh, the model which we have. How these alternative models can create a women entrepreneurs, or it can give a betterment of the lives of uh, women. Actually, women do not think about anything which is a high fi thing. They think about how my family can live sustainability is sustainable, and how my family life, economic life, can improve. That's all they think about it. If the, that can happen, they can understand any language, whatever you language you speak, actually. So uh, what did was happening that when we gave them the technology, they started understanding how this technology can be used for a local content, how they can use the technology for making the handloom uh, weaving designs, and how they can archive those designs, and how they can understand the new fashion and new technology as well they can understand the uh, they can understand what can they can use it for not only for education but also for a job but also for the entertainment Major, most of the time they are prohibited by the entertainment so they want to access these technology for the entertainment purpose as well so it's uh, uh, if I have to say that why the gender, these alternative models are, have been not been uh, been able to cater gender aspect, I think some of them are more or less on that platform. But the only deep dive into the research and deep dive into that how it can cater into the simpler language and how it can be into the lower low cost technology and affordability can be given to them. Um, I completely agree that social patriarchy channel, which exists in India a lot, women are still not given the technology on the hands of a mom. So when you give the technology, that makes them a owner, ownership comes to them. They use the technology as they wanted and how they can improve their lives, actually. Thank you so much, Ritu, for sharing those insights uh, again and for sharing your work with us. Uh, uh, some, of, uh, some of what you were speaking resonated with uh, some of the other initiatives that also we have included in our output paper. Uh, Agustina can uh, talk about some of these initiatives that have already implemented these kind of gender perspectives. So, you know, we, we can understand what that, that does look like in practice. Thank you very much, Radhika. Well, first of all, I'm really happy of being here today after this very erected month of work at the VPF Gender, uh, and especially these few weeks. Um, my name is Agustina Calegari. I work for, for the Internet Society, and I'm, I have been supporting the work of the VPF this year. So what I would like to do is to briefly address three initiatives that the Internet Society is supporting through our community of chapters that can show us how the gender perspective could be, could be included when developing a project for improving access to the Internet, uh, so we can give communities meaningful access in terms that we have been discussing here at the BPF. Well, we have the first one, and we have been talking a lot about community networks today. Um, we hear very valuable um, perspectives and comments from all the panelists. So I, I will be brief about uh, this case, but I especially wanted to mention because I had uh, the possibility to visit the project uh, in Honduras last June that was uh, launched by the Internet Society chapter of Honduras, and I think Eduardo was around here. I'm not sure if he's today. But 
when we, uh, the, the project of the chapter of Nura is supporting through Internet Society Beyond the Net grant, and we, when we first received the application, the gender perspective was not included there, it's okay, it was a community network uh, project, it was focusing on access, but then we started to, to see, or at least from my experience, from from talking to Eduardo about this project, is that seeing the community, this rural community uh, from indigenous uh, people, Lenca community in Honduras, uh, were integrated mostly by women, uh, the, pro uh, the project management or the team realized that they needed to do something about, uh, about gender and they needed to include, um, well, they include not to, the, to support women on the ground, so they give them the tools to to use the community network to to take advantage of this internet access they they were about to have. So I think that taking some of the comments that were made by Nick and and Rui too? no yeah sorry, um, I think that the the first thing that helped uh, the team to develop this project is the type of activity that the women of this community were doing at that moment. They were by the time uh, running a radio. They had um, a radio program where every morning they, um, they talk about their activities and they communicate with this, their people about news, um, different stuff. So the radio was run by women and only by women and they were very proud about this. Um, when they have the radio, they ask the, um, the chapter that were supporting them on the crowd, and now what is next? We need the internet to be able to have more content for our, for our program, and that's what they did. And the second part of, of the, well, let's say gender component of, of this initiative, I, it's not the right term, but let's say that this, was that they, um, they gave the tools uh, to these women to, to learn not only how to, to use technology, for most of them uh, internet access uh, was something totally new, but also to be able to climb the tower and be able to fix the, the infrastructure in case they need it. So they were very proud of, of being able to climb the tower and support uh, the initiative from, from the scrap. So that was the, the first project I, I want to mention. And the second one, well, it's, it's related to public Wi-Fi. Um, it's a project that is developed in Mexico by the Secretariat of Communications and Transport that is using the, what they call the digital connected points, which is like, yeah, I don't know how to say it in English, but there are like uh, places where people can go to have access, for, access to the internet for free and, and also to use a computer and to take uh, online lessons uh, to run a spe a, a specific project about uh, on women in STEM. So they are, um, uh, they are offering young women uh, from different communities to, to go to these uh, places where they have public Wi-Fi to take a course on digital skills, um, uh, to support young women from public high schools uh, and encourage them to pursue a career in STEM. So that's the second one. And the third one, as we haven't uh, spoken about that is related to TV white spaces. Again, we are not focusing here in, in the technology itself. I, in fact, uh, not comfortable about TV white spaces itself, but what I want to, to, to mention here is that, uh, again, the, through our, uh, uh, one of the grant programs that the Internet Society has, the chapter on Tanzania, um, build a pilot project using TV white spaces, equipment as a community network solution. And they decided to, to give access to three schools in remote areas. Um, uh, well, this has to do with, with again, with, um, with the reality in the country where they have um, schools divided by sex. So they, they target one school 
specific for women, and they decided to do the pilot project there and to give them also the, the tools to, um, to develop digital skills. So I think that what the third thing has in common, well, have in common more, is that they didn't start it as, um, a with a gender approach, but once they, they, um, they have the access and they realized that there was a need there, they decided to, to um, well, to um, include women and use uh, the gender perspective. Thank you so much, Agustina, for telling us about also the projects that you are involved with and uh, all of these uh, other projects that we've been really trying hard, as uh, she mentioned, over the past few months to like really collect and make sure that we're mapping them uh, to the best extent in our paper. Um, okay, so uh, the last question for this, Renata, you want, yeah? Hi, sorry. I'm Renata Quino Ribeiro, MAG member. I'm using the speaking queue, which is a way to ask for the floor uh, during this IGF. You can find it all on the IGF website. And I just wanted to make a quick intervention uh, on, the, on the sequence of the panel. Uh, these are all very interesting uh, cases and, and studies, um, but we had we have to get a little bit back to, to jump forward. Uh, in uh, 2015, this BPF uh, had uh, one of its greatest um, uh, participations of the year, wanted and un unwanted, <laughs> uh, as it tackled the theme, violence against women. So there were many trolls that, uh, that uh, targeted the BPF at one time. And on 2016, I have a picture of the room. And uh, it's one of those pictures, be very careful what you ask for because you may get it. So we had a room that 10 people were standing up and 10 people were sitting on the floor it was so busy it was. And now we have here on the room, mm, less than half of the room. Um, and we're watching, we're listening about cases of all over the world. So I think one of the, what, what changed? What made the difference? So I think one of the things that changed is two words there, non-binary. So there are still so many barriers for this BPF to cross. There are still so many technologies that we need to discuss having other angles in mind uh, on gender than uh, the ones we are researching in. Um, I really want to pay attention to the other speaker in the cases again, but I just want to say that uh, it was a great job and great cases you're bringing. And it just showed that the BPF is being very revolutionary, bringing something that maybe people are even starting to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inputs, Renata. Renata has uh, helped us a lot from uh, MAG this year in coming up with these outputs and putting this together. And uh, yes, that is the intention. We, we are trying to move beyond the gender binary this time and really focus uh, on also gender non-binary persons. We've tried to have calls where, you know, we can specifically focus on uh, like unique needs and challenges that these communities face. Uh, unfortunately, so far, we haven't been able to map any specific initiatives along this, but the efforts do continue and hopefully they will be taken forward uh, in future BPFs uh, if the BPFs do get uh, renewed. Uh, so um, uh, to wrap up this uh, segment, uh, I will just ask Andri to maybe uh, quickly in a minute uh, give us briefly some key recommendations, uh, policy recommendations, for example, uh, for incorporating gender perspectives in uh, the implementation of supplementary uh, models of connectivity. And uh, after that, we can open up, uh, sorry, after that, we will uh, go into our second segment because of, uh, of time. And uh, we will, at the end, open it up for uh, comments and questions from everyone. So if you have any questions, just uh, park them. We, we will come back to you in, in a bit. Thanks, and I'm going to use the opportunity to also jump in on what, um, on what was just said by Renata. Um, 
I think it's a little bit of an unfair comparison, and as a researcher, I have to bring up that the room is much smaller in the previous two instances, so I think it's a little bit, yeah. Um, I think also, I mean, it's a, it's, I mean, as I said in, when I started talking, is that I think it's really e interesting evolution to see how the focus of the Best Practice Forum has become much more focused, really. Um, and I think that's really, that's good because it also shows, and if I look at the findings from this year, um, I think the biggest takeaway is that there is so little on this, um, and that's why there's such a need to actually be working on this. And I was really glad to hear about the work that's, that's happening um, at different levels, and to be frank, we're not going to be able to tackle this properly until we properly understand it. Um, and that's also, I think, the bigger reason why there's such a need for more data on these issues. Um, and that's anecdotal, which I think the Best Practice Forum has been really good at collecting, is a lot of anecdotal evidence, but also more sort of qualitative um, research that can look, you know, more in-depth. Um, and then also the quantitative side, the, the, st the statistics that really sort of show the, the mere, mere um, discrepancies. Um, I think, um, to actually answer your question, um, what I could gather from Ritu and, um, and Nick is, again, the importance of agency, but making sure agency isn't tokenistic. Um, and that's from, you know, considering the women who don't mind um, scaling towers to, um, you know, the what does meaningful access mean and how do we ensure that that doesn't detract from people being able to participate in their communities in a way that's still meaningful. So I think that's, that was actually really interesting is how do we understand meaningful um, in this, and I mean, and, and, the, and the words we use do matter. So if we talk about connecting and enabling or if you talk about meaningful access, what do we actually mean? And that's maybe something that we also need to sort of start considering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andri. I think it's a mark of a good segment if we are left with more questions than answers at the end of it. But hopefully, this is something that we will try to address and uh, respond to uh, going ahead. If I could just quickly, uh, because of our, our time constraints, I will definitely open this up for questions. But maybe if you could uh, keep all the comments and the questions uh, towards the end, uh, we will uh, spend a good 10 minutes uh, responding to all of them. So please don't worry. I, I see all the hands up. Um, uh, if I will just quickly take some time for segment two right now, uh, and can we have Alejandra on a stage uh, to join us for segment two? And Bruna as well. Uh, Rajika, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna jump in because I, I have to leave um, uh, the human rights Gender and youth main session is in a little while. I hope you all uh, attend too. And uh, to get back to what Henri was saying, yes, we asked for a bigger room and we asked to, to research more. And I think that's why we are facing uh, challenges. And perhaps we should look also at initiatives that cannot exist. I was censored three times during the year of this BPF. I did a project on blockchain and future of technology and how uh, with children and children saying that it would be good to have anonymization on the internet and to have a respect for people, uh, uh, for homosexual couples and so on. And this uh, video never ended up being shown anywhere. Um, another very big conference, uh, the Chaos Computer Conference, uh, uh, threatened to uh, expel a non-binary person that is part of the IGF Netherlands community this year. And uh, we try to tell that story in many different ways. We're censored in many different ways. And there are a lot of other cases. I don't want to dwell on that. But I think uh, uh, when the, where there's smoke, there's fire. If we didn't find it, uh, we should be looking for it. Thanks. Thank you so much for your inputs, Renata. Um, and they're very well noted as well. Uh, so uh, thank you once again to all the speakers in segment one. Can you please just join me in thanking all the speakers for segment one? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will begin segment two right now. Uh, 
we will quickly uh, conclude segment two and then get to the questions. So please do stay for uh, questions and comments towards the end. We will get to you uh, as soon as we're done with this. Uh, okay, so uh, segment two is really about focusing on the work that BPF has done and how we can improve this going forward. Like what are the different collaborations that we can have with different stakeholders, different uh, bodies within IGF, um, and you know, the different topics that we can explore going forward. So it's really like looking forward to 2019 optimistically. So uh, I'll start off by uh, asking uh, Bruna if you could just uh, give me in uh, a couple of minutes uh, uh, your thoughts on how we can better communicate the uh, work of the BPF to the public and uh, in what ways we can really improve the collaborations between BPF gender and other fora in IGF because uh, as we've been saying, it's really important for us to work in a community-driven, multi-stakeholder manner. So how can we really uh, get better at that next year. Thank you very much, Hadika. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Can I just ask um, if there's anyone here who like works with gender-related research? Please raise your hand if you're doing any work in the gender area. Like, We have quite a few. Good. Um, yeah, we, I have heard, I heard these days a friend saying that he had enough of the gender talk at the IGF. But then we still have like, we still, I mean, it's the fourth year, prob four, fourth or fifth year of the BPF gender and we still, f every single year we, we get to find a new subject and we get to find a new topic on related to it. And it's a never ending um, research, or research or like project. And so, I mean, the question, like the answer to this is there isn't enough like talk of gender talk at the IGF, we still need, this space for collaboration and for work. And um, I do um, agree with um, what Henri said earlier that it's a really good fact that we started opening the, the work of the BPF for the non-binary. I myself work with an organization, Brazilian organization called Coding Rights. We have been doing digital training, digital security training with um, journalists, as uh, civil society activists, and we're focused on women and non-binary. So it is awesome to have like a space like this um, open to this sort of participation. But then, um, if whenever we think about how, how to make this work better, um, what makes this work better and, and what like makes our life easier and like more complete, it's participation. So, I mean, all of you are invited to collaborate with us and um, we're very open, obviously. We have been doing this work um, for the past years, like from scratch, and we need help. So if any of you who raised the hands saying, I work with gender issues, wants to help us, please do. Because um, again, um, there are a lot of subjects, like it, whether or not it's barriers, whether or not it's access or um, violence or abuse, um, it's a never ending thing. And then um, if, if I could like just finishing up, just wrapping up the talk, uh, how could we do a better bridging with the, the rest of the IGF community and the rest of like the broader IG community. It's, it's, we did a, I think we did a pretty good job uh, two years ago when we mapped some of the initiatives around the world that they were doing a little work on capacity building and barrier, like breaking barriers. So I'd say that step one would be to reach out to these people and like redo the work like again to say like, hi, we need collaboration on this and we need your work to be part of ours. Or, I mean, we need to feed into your work because obviously IGF is a very, very small world and like a little part of this world. And I mean, we could use a little help. And um, last but not least, um, on, the, on the how we should do it with the, the rest of the IGF community, I would say that um, the, the divide and conquer approach would be the best one. So if we could get as many people on the other BPFs and dynamic coalitions doing raising their hands and saying, hi, can we do a little gender approach here? Like, can we do a little talk on this? Because otherwise it will be like this forever going, like technical and masculine conversation that ne never improves. Uh, um, and then um, finish wrapping up, um, there's uh, the high level panel on digital cooperation, which is starting now. One of the approaches <coughs> of the high level panel is gender. So it's another space that we should be like, keeping our eyes at like the high level, one of the, the functions or one of the plans for, for the high level panel is to strengthen the IGF. So it's, a, it's an outside work that will be reflecting on our work here. So 
I mean, let's just keep an eyes in every single space of this community as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bruna, for those uh, constructive pointers. And I think we all agree that uh, gender should be a cross-cutting theme across uh, all fora that we discussed. It shouldn't just be something that is relegated to specific forums that only discuss gender. Um, so it's something that we should speak about in everything from <coughs> artificial intelligence to uh, cyber security. It, it should really be something that is a perspective that we apply to uh, everything that we do at IGF and beyond. So thank you for uh, pointing that out. Uh, to, to end this segment, uh, I'd like to ask Alejandra uh, to uh, tell us about what uh, your perspectives are on the topics that BPF can, uh, if renewed, uh, uh, take up uh, next year and how we can uh, improve our collaborations across the different uh, stakeholders. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you very much for all of you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here with all of you. Um, I, I would like uh, to say that I'm happy to see some men in this room, but I really expect to see more men and more women, like Renata uh, said. Gender issues have to be important for all of us, men and women, and it's not only a woman issues. I hope in the next year we are more. <laughs> uh, regarding the question, uh, I would like to say um, the, I, I think the BPF should focus on promoting access to science and technology for girls since they are in primary schools or even uh, before, from the first years of life. And for that, we must work in an integral way with the educational system and with families. For that, the BPF would seek to support or give visibility, learn from experiences that work in this sense. Because I think give connectivity and devices to everyone is not enough to don't leave anyone behind in the digital world. We must change the patterns of socialization and construction of meaning for women to access and incorporate themselves into study and work with technologies. And I say this with knowledge. I'm from Uruguay. I live in Uruguay. I work for the government in Uruguay. There we have no difference uh, internet access uh, to, to internet to access to internet and devices from women and, and men. We have a public policy or of excel, excellent connectivity. Uh, I could say that for Uruguayans, the internet is as free as water or air. And we also have a public policy for each child or teens and for each retired to have their own computer or tablet. Doesn't matter the sex but women are still less involved with technologies. They continue to appropriate technology less and differently. They continue to work differently with them, and they are still one or two out of 10 STEM students. We must work on strategies to change socialization patterns, work in collaboration with the educational system since preschool, their, their experiences of working with the education system starting from the secondary or university, but it's not enough. They are, uh, also, I think they have to start earlier. Uh, the construction patterns of what is appropriate or not, of what you want to be or not, conform much earlier than you are in the secondary or school or in the university. That is why I believe that the BPF should focus on the search for experiences that have to do with this. And I also believe in the promotion of this experience. I believe that as long as we don't affect this, we won't achieve significant changes in the involvement and equal access of women in ICT. I, according to a study conducted in Uruguay, and I think it's the same in all around the world, gender stereotypes are one of the main factors that explain the low participation of women in science, technology, and innovation. Uh, the study also mentions the importance of addressing the construction of subjectivity and gender roles in different age groups. In this sense, they say, there is no worse discrimination than the one that gets in the, in the mind to, of the discriminated. I think it would be very positive for BPF to work on this factor. We have to combat these prejudices, and for that, we have to go to childhood 
to families, to teachers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandra, uh, for, for those uh, excellent suggestions on how we can move forward. And uh, hopefully, some of those will be taken on board when we focus uh, next year if the BPF does get renewed. Um, I will now open up the floor to uh, some questions or comments. Um, we will keep it open for a few minutes. And then our uh, mailing list is always open. And uh, usually, uh, we do keep engaging on it. So even if you can't uh, bring in your question here, please feel free to send us uh, a mail on the mailing list. And you will definitely get uh, some replies. But uh, I'll open it up now. Uh, if you have any. Um, Questions or comments, uh, you could just raise your hand and we could start. Okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Radhika. Um, well, my name is Raquel Gato. I'm also a MAG member. Uh, my name is involved with the BPF, honestly, just because uh, we were defending the BPF uh, um, in the, uh, within the MAG to, to happen this year. But I really want to shout out to those uh, two ladies in front, Radhika, Agostina, Paula, and others, who really helped and uh, make this work uh, happen. Uh, they were really awesome. And uh, so I want to start by saying that. <laughs> Please let me clap for them. And, um, and also, what I want to make as a comment uh, that is really important um, as we look forward also for next year and the continuation of uh, these discussions, um, how can we um, reinforce and what are the topics? I think we, we started uh, bringing that up. But also within the MAG work, it's important to show uh, the importance uh, of the discussions and uh, how uh, these outcomes documents can be a reference, uh, not only for governments, for all stakeholders. They, they have a tangible uh, results, and, and, and it can be picked up. So um, this is also a call for everyone in the room and outside, and everyone that can contribute with this discussion. I think it's important to, to have this in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comments, Raquel. And thank you also for your involvement with uh, the session this year. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Belen Jimenez. I'm from Paraguay. I'm one of the Youth at IGF fellows this year. And uh, I want to say so many things. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you uh, for this. I think that talking about uh, gender and also uh, uh, talking about the non-binary non individuals is also something great. And I also hope that in the future we can talk about uh, feminism in the internet as well, because there, there are, as you know, uh, feminist principles in the internet. And it would be so great to have a space uh, in events like this as well, even though I, I know and I understand that it's not that easy, right? Because there are still some barriers to overcome and probably some uh, situations in which some things are censored still because they are unknown for some people. Um, but uh, yeah, I was just wondering as well, since we're talking about the impact of supplementary models of connectivity, if you consider the, the existence of uh, autonomous uh, servers, like feminist servers, server, something like that you guys could, could use as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for the suggestion. We uh, were initially just looking at four different models of connectivity. Uh, we were initially just looking at four different models of connectivity, uh, yeah. but uh, that's an excellent suggestion, and it's something that we can definitely expand and uh, also also look at. Uh, so thank you for thank you for that. If you're if you know of any specific initiatives, we encourage you to uh, send us uh, send us those contributions to our mailing list as well. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Yes, please. Uh, Vale from IPC, doing sexuality on the internet. Okay, so I think uh, it's not a rhetorical thanks, because uh, to the expansion for women to gender non-binary, I'm so happy, and this is hard work, and this is really hitting uh, a nerve in a community that is very conservative. And second, I really like, I'm not so young. I just cover my white with pink. But I think that this panel, it's really 
intergenerational, but it's also a change of people that are talking and leading. And the best paradigm for, forum, it's a lot of work. For me, it's been very interesting listening because it reminds me the basic of uh, feminism, but also working inside community. And the delicate balance when you enter in a community between the community and the individual, and also what we leave behind. Because we can come and make the change and show the light, and then we leave. But the people that live in the community, the women and the gender non-binary that have been uh, uh, outed, they stay. So I think this is really at the core of what we really need to understand when we talk about uh, connectivity or access and all the different uh, layers. And I find really interesting the fact that the youngest generation, when they are exposed, that's a generate a living. Because this is, this is also interesting to understand the resistance that a community can have, because the community then become depleted. So yes, it's a lot of work. I don't promise anything. But I, I, I will not say that I've been inspired. But I, I see that there is a continuation of the work. And it's a very tough, difficult work. And I think it's really important that we all contribute for all our different places of resistance. Thanks. Thank you so much for your inputs. Are there any other questions or uh, comments? We can take uh, one final comment before we wrap up. Yes, please. Hi, sorry. Um, this is Jack, also from APC. I was very reluctant to take the floor because I wanted others to speak first. Um, but having been involved in many BPFs, it's really great to see um, this one today and the diversity that Vale mentioned as well. I just want to echo what Raquel is saying. I think that the Best Practice Forum is actually a very useful space to bring together a bunch of different stakeholder groups to discuss what are some of the best practices, particularly on emerging issues, and this can have really good impact. So for example, the first Best Practice Forum was talking about online gender-based violence before many international, uh, many global processes, policy processes started discussing it. And that document is still cited in um, as recent as the um, uh, re uh, UN resolution on violence against women today, uh, this year. So I think it can have really strong impact, um, but it does, I think part of the value of it is that it becomes this really great co-agitating space with many different stakeholders to figure out an emerging issue and to figure out who's doing what around it and to understand how is it defined, what are the impact, and to focus on specific communities. So in that sense, I cannot stress enough the value of this platform, no matter how that the, con the work continues um, throughout the, the, the future years. Um, Secondly, I want to maybe give a concrete recommend recommendation around the how as well, is to make more strong uh, interconnective work with other dynamic coalitions. Um, so for example, dynamic coalition on public libraries would have been a really great one to work on with this, um, and also community networks and so forth. Um, and finally, a proposal for next year, because I think we've been working on access for three years now. Um, so I feel that uh, the, um, you know, there's the, the landscape has also changed. We are also focusing on more specificity and focus, which is really great. Um, but I would, like, I would like to throw a proposal out there, which is to look at um, the economy and work, actually, digital economies and work. I think that this is also an emerging area that has many different intersecting pieces, including machine learning, including development and SDGs, including all kinds of, including access issues and STEM as well, which was raised. So I would like to throw that as a suggestion. Thanks. Thank you so much for your comments as well as uh, your suggestions, Jack. I'd just like to mention to everyone here that Jack has been very instrumental in all the BPF so far, and even at the beginning of this year when we were still grappling with this issue and trying to you know, really figure out uh, where to focus um, on, on this paper and this session, Jack helped us a lot in, giving us, um, in helping us figure out what the vision uh, could be. So thank you for your involvement also with the BPFs and for your comments uh, today at the session. Uh, so this, uh, OK, OK, maybe we can take one quick uh, final comment. Hi, thank you. Um, so again, to repeat, uh, congratulations to you all. The work has been amazing. And the ability to get your hands on and bring more women to actually do the deployments and the capacity building and everything, converting the words into action is great. So congratulations to you all. Also, we have been in touch this past month with uh, Doreen Botgan, who was elected as a woman director for the ITU 
development sector, which uh, was a new thing that never happened in the ITU in the last over 150 years. So we have been talking with her this month and she definitely wants to bring capacity building with girls into what the ITU has been doing with the Girls ICT Day to expand that. So I would like to extend the invitation to you all. I cannot do that myself, uh, but if we can create a coalition to work together in that, I think it will be amazing. Thank you. Just to answer that question, we have been connecting with Doreen because uh, she's also the chair of EQUAS, which is the global partnership for tackling the digital gender divide. So, well, I think also in previous years, the, well, previous years, well, it's equal, it's quite new, but the BPF have been connecting with, with EQUAS and we, we are doing the same this year and we, are, we will like to do the same next year for the girls in ICT Day. So, thank you very much for your comment. Okay, so if there are any other questions and comments, as I said, uh, you can, if you're not already subscribed to our mailing list, please do subscribe to our mailing list and uh, you can always send us uh, mails on that and we will respond and uh, continue these discussions. This, this session is not meant to have like an end to the conversation, it's meant to open up a lot more questions and have a lot, uh, start a lot more new conversations that we will be continuing um, throughout uh, you know, going forward even after this IGFN. So that, that's that's the motivation. So please do continue to bring in these wonderful comments. Uh, as I said before, uh, we have produced a draft version of the output paper that has some of these key findings that we were talking about in the beginning. It's on the on the IGF website, so you will find it there. There is an option like uh, to add a comment uh, to any of the parts of the paper. So uh, if you think that there's something that you'd like to uh, respond to specifically, you can leave those comments directly on the website or also, of course, you can uh, mail us. That's always an option. If there are any initiatives that we have missed out, uh, we would love to hear your inputs. We'd love to hear suggestions for, uh, you know, uh, uh, other spaces that we can look at and focus on for this year. So please do send in those suggestions as well. We're very open to receiving those contributions. And uh, finally, uh, I hope that the BPF does get renewed next year. We've had some excellent suggestions in today's session on uh, some topics that we can take it forward with. So uh, that's uh, that's always uh, a hope. Uh, in the end, I'd just like to uh, like thank everyone who's been involved in this process to make all of this happen. Uh, it has been uh, it has been a very uh, interesting journey so far. So uh, Augustina for helping uh, uh, coordinate all of this. Uh, Paula, who's uh, not on stage here, but she's here. She's uh, been on all our calls and has helped uh, us with uh, all the work we've put in for the paper as well as the session. Uh, Renata from uh, MAG, who we heard speak earlier. Uh, Raquel from uh, MAG. Uh, Andri, uh, who's uh, helped also with previous uh, BPFs. Uh, Jack, who also we uh, we heard from right now. Uh, Bruna, and uh, I just, I cannot name every single person who's been involved, but thank you to everyone who's been involved in all the meetings, all the calls, uh, everyone who submitted inputs, uh, gave in their comments, uh, reviews, um, everyone who's present uh, in the session today, all the speakers as well as all the participants, um, those who are present uh, in person or remotely, as well as all the volunteers who uh, volunteer to help us, uh, you know, connect us to different uh, people who are working in the field and suggested different initiatives to us. Um, Thank you so much for all your effort. Uh, the reason we're able to produce anything of the sort right now today is because of uh, the excellent efforts put in by everyone involved. So uh, thank you so much. The main session for gender is now going to start uh, at uh, 4.30 in room one. So you can uh, head to that. We're uh, thankfully down on time. Uh, so thank you so much once again for joining us. Thank you.